at that point your love is unencumbered because it's totally encumbered to Christ it's totally unencumbered to everybody else and therefore you don't need their reciprocation you don't need their approval you don't need them to be attractive you just plain love them anyway because it's an outflow of your love for Christ this is the same love oh my pastor wow I haven't thought about this in years the pastor spent a lot of time on this this is the same love that Christ has for everybody while he's on the cross I hope you understand the Christ love for father colored everything it was forefather or forget it to him. He fulfilled the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and thinking. It just says the Lord your God. It doesn't say people. That's the second commandment. And it's kind of really small. Love the na your neighbor as yourself. Okay, but how much love do you have for yourself if instead you're loving God with all your heart and soul and mind? then you don't have any love for yourself. So you're not, there's no room left. Okay, so then all the love you have is coming through this other love that's first and totally all-encompassing. Christ's love for Father is total and all-encompassing. We don't mean anything compared to father and we wouldn't want to that's totally moral and right why should we compete with father for Christ's attention or love or even consideration we shouldn't okay but then nobody should compete with the love for God that we end up getting either and at this stage occupation with Christ that's exactly what happens you have the same love that Christ had. At that point, you are actually truly loving people. That was the theme of 1 John. I can't hate you if I love him. There's no room for hatred. I, I don't even know how. See, if you're totally fulfilled or preoccupied or occupied with Christ, occupied really, preoccupied means you're irrational. If you're occupied with Christ, there's no room for anybody else. He is your glasses. You're seeing through his eyes. There's nothing else. Therefore, everything else, everyone else, is the recipient of your need to have an outlet for your love for him. And therefore they are truly being loved for the first time. When you loved before, it was based on attraction. When you loved before, it was based on need. When you loved before, it was based on some sort of competing, at, you know, competition or a sense of honor or something else that all the human race has in common. The human race has its own idea of love. But it's not love. Just like Paul was saying in Romans 5. You're going to lay your, your life down for a total stranger? That's what Christ did. And really do that. With this kind of grueling thought pattern lifestyle. For what? You have to have you have to have an object. You're not God. You can't you can't do it irrespective of an object. The object has to be Christ and that's holding you together and therefore all the rest of your love for everybody else is an outflow. That's why you're in the docket. This is what Satan could not do. To Satan, love had to be based on some kind of merit in the object of his love. Okay, well, God is total merit. Okay, but Satan's thinking, well, no, that has to apply across the board. In other words, his argument was good deeds. It has to be based on good deeds. 
In other words, I do for you, you do for me. I love you so long as you do for me. You love me so long as I do for you. Yeah, hi, and nobody's ever, ever going to be able to live up to that. So where's the grace? Well, grace isn't possible unless there is a prior satisfaction. You can't have grace towards somebody else who's poor if you're poor. If you got no money to give, then you can't give anything. If, on the other hand, you have enough money, then you can afford to give. And you can even give sacrificially. But you gotta have enough to stay alive yourself. So, you gotta have enough left over, which means you gotta have something first. You gotta have Christ first in your head before you're gonna have enough left over to love somebody else. Satan never got that far. And he certainly didn't get far enough where he could throw himself down the way Christ did. And here you are, finally at the place where you're occupied with Christ, so you're in the docket because now you're doing and living and thinking like Christ did. And you're falling down the whole time too. But every time you get back up, it's for the same reason. It's the same lifestyle as God himself lives. The fact that you sin is, irre is, is irrelevant. What's only relevant at this stage is whether you stay the course. Whether you, you know, you're running now, you're in the marathon race, you're close to the finish line. Do you take that next step? Do you keep going to the goal? Rabion. Philippians 3.14 is talking about this goal that you see off in the distance. It's the finish line. It's the destination of life. Which Paul calls it in, in Ephesians 4.13. They, they translate it just destination, but it really means destination of life. You can look it up in any lexicon like Bauer Danker and they'll tell you that. You see the goal and the distance. I keep plotting to the goal. Do you take that next step? Not do you fall down. Do you get back up and take the next step? If you keep doing that, my pastor said this a thousand times, if you just keep taking the next step, God will get you there. Don't quit. The, you're in the docket for whether you'll quit. Satan's going to throw everything at you, not personally, but through his demon babies. Okay? God's going to let him. It's just like the story of Job, only harder. Do you take the next step? Do you fall down? Use 1 John 1 9 and take the next step, which only God can enable you to do. And how are you going to want to do that? Living Christ, dying prophet, that's it. That's the only motive you've got left. Everything has died at this point. You've either lost your family and gotten them back again, or you've lost them. You know, Job's story. You lost everything you owned, and maybe you got it back again. You're going to have both. You're going to get it back again because that's destabilizing. It's destabilizing to lose. It's destabilizing to have prosperity. It's going to be too much in one direction and the other. Anything to keep you off base. Anything to knock you down so you, you'll want to quit. Because it'll be too much. And people are going to even say to you, like you know, Job's wife said to him, Why don't you quit? Curse God and die already. And you'll hear that too. And you'll lose friends and family and they'll think you're nuts. And you know, how much you tell them is another story, but at this point you're kind of aware that you better not say what's really going on because they're not going to understand it. Notice the parallel to Christ? He goes to the cross. He told people in advance what was going to happen, what happened when he did that. That was what, John 5, when he did the miracle? And just shortly after that, that was when he told the disciples what was really going to happen? Yeah, and he lost a whole bunch of those disciples, left him. 
And he said to the twelve, I think that's in Matthew, just before um, Matthew 16. He says, are you going to leave me too? I think that's at the beginning of Matthew 16. He just finished doing the miracle, just finished explaining what was going to happen. Everybody peeled off because he did the miracle. It was too much. It was too in their face. Yeah, he's really God. So a lot of people left him and he said to the disciples, you're going to leave also? And that's when Peter did his thing. No, you're really God. What are we going to do? Where else are we going to go? That's going to be your attitude. You know, Peter was still a you know spiritual kid at that point. But, but that was the base that he kept living on. You see, this is really hard. There's no good deed on the earth, or all the good deeds put together are not hard like this. Bringing every thought into captivity? Living Christ, dying prophet? Everything else doesn't mean anything to you anymore? Life is this total slog of constantly monitoring your thoughts, and you're never getting it right, and you're always falling down? But every time you're between sins, it's a God deed, no matter what you're doing. Because God's working on you to make you take that next step. He's the one who's causing you to walk. Katas, kavon, diorko, fail, sin. I got mad at windows again. Kata, one job one night. Katas, kavon, diorko. Oops, I got mad at windows again. Use one job one night. Yeah, a thousand times a day. You want to kill yourself or quit the whole pressure is to get you to quit and the only reason you don't is living Christ dying prophet eyes on him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings for the purpose of conforming to his death and you're living the life that Jesus Christ lived down here same style. It's a style. It's the same style of spirituality. Not the same execution. The same style. Satan gave up on that style. And he didn't even go as far as Christ had to go. We're going farther than Satan ever went. We aren't obviously going as far as Christ, but we're going farther than Moses went. Moses couldn't go this far. That's why it says Moses longed to see our day. See my day. That's why Christ said that. Or Abraham longed to see my day. They couldn't go that far. There was no Christ to clone into their heads. They saw him through shadow. That's what the book of Hebrews was saying. In Hebrews 10. Everything was a shadow to them. It was fuzzy. And granted, the mature ones among them were light years ahead of the, you know, the, the baby Christian down here. But the legacy of Christ to us Christians is way higher than Moses ever knew. So how much more liable are we going to be if we don't go there? What's the stronger punishment for us if we don't go here. How about this? Getting to heaven, finding out this truth, only of course you'll know it perfectly at that moment, and knowing that you didn't you didn't go there. That you rejected it. And you have to live with that knowledge forever. God's not gonna be spanking you. You're gonna live forever knowing that you denied the inheritance that God granted, that you threw it away, that you abdicated, just like Edward VIII, you know, him and Wallace Simpson, you abdicated. And the money that he was going to give you, the wealth he was going to give you, is going to go to the king that's going to be over you. That's Isaiah 53, 12. 
you're the booty, you're shared out to the Atsumim, the kings. Your booty for them and all the wealth that God had assigned you is going to go to them and they'll spend some of it on you. But they get it because you said no. you got to live with that forever. You have to face Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to look at you and you're just going to know, oh my, boy did I screw it up down here. We're all going to say that. But we don't all have to be saying, I could have had this closeness to you forever. I could have had all this wealth that I could have spent on you, my Lord God, forever. And I said no. I don't want that moment to happen to me. I honestly don't give a flip whether people like me or not down here. Because this is my whole life now. And I don't care if I sound religious or good or bad or anything else. I, I have an extreme low opinion of myself. And that doesn't even matter anymore. Living Christ, dying prophet. I don't have time to care about how I think about myself or whether I'm a good person or whether I'm attractive even to myself because I'm never going to be. I don't like me. And I never will. So what? Doesn't matter. I got something better to do. Living Christ, I am prophet. Okay, Dad, I'm screwed up. What, what should I think now? He'll still tell me. The Holy Spirit will pick me up. I'll use 1 John 1 9. He'll still tell me. Whatever's wrong with me, he'll fix. So I have reason to get up. I can't be any worse than I already am. The more I know God, the more I hate myself. Of course, Christ told us that that's how it was going to be. You have to hate your life. Yeah, I do hate my life. I can't measure up to him. Living Christ, I'm prophet. His standard matters. Anything else I think is told bupkis. See? This is how you live. This is how God lives. He lives as if he hated himself. He's always throwing himself down. Because he wants to. Living Christ, dying prophet. That I may know him. And the fellowship of his sufferings. This is what Christ did. He threw himself down. To Satan, this is total masochism. And to any normal person, it should be considered masochism. Okay. Are you a masochist, God? Okay, then I need to be one too. Like Ruth said to Boaz. Wherever you go, that's where I'm going. Or he said it, she said it to her mother-in-law. Wherever you go, I'm going. Living Christ, dying prophet. This is how you are, God. It sounds totally insane. Abraham with his son. God says to Abraham, take your son up the mountain and kill him. That's totally insane. And Hebrews 11 tells us that he reckoned he'd get his son back from the dead. But he figured he'd have to go through the actual process of killing him. That's totally insane. It's insane! And, when you're occupied with Christ, you know why what seems insane is not you know where it's really headed and you hate it all at the same time and you can't live without it all at the same time because your dream come true is Christ and your worst nightmare is the life you got your worst nightmare is the truth and your dream come true is the truth so like Paul you get up again kata skopon dioko living Christ dying prophet That's the God deed. Because only God's word in you, Christ in you, the confidence of glory, that's all that gets you through. It's the only thing that will motivate you to get up. You see the difference between a God deed and a good deed? There's nothing about a God deed that has any visible benefit in this life. There's nothing about a God deed that is glorious, glamorous, attractive, 
doesn't even make any sense. Just like the gospel doesn't make any sense. But since truth is free by God's decree, and since he throws himself down, rather than just being and make everything work the way he wants, guess what your life has to be? And that makes total sense. If it's good enough for God, it's good enough for you. So, preview of coming attractions, that introduces us now to the nature of the God Deeds Mindset.